uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me uh, say you that today we have a workshop on uh, views from Russia and uh, Egypt uh, on the situation in Syria. And uh, let me give the floor to uh, Andrei Kortunov, Director General at the REAC, to open our meeting today. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, let me say that I'm very glad uh, uh, to see some of my old uh, friends here. And uh, definitely, I am very grateful uh, to our partners, to the Egyptian Council of Foreign Affairs, uh, for the uh, standing commitment uh, to continue our discussions. Uh, I do recall how we hosted a delegation from Cairo in Moscow many years ago, and since that time, uh, we continue our fruitful deliberations on various aspects uh, of the situation in the MENA region and beyond. Uh, definitely, this meeting is uh, somewhat special because uh, we have to discuss issues of the region <clears throat> uh, which are overshadowed by the crisis in the Russian-Ukrainian relations and by the Russian special military operation on the territory of Ukraine. <coughs> this is clearly a game changer. And uh, these uh, very tragic developments will undoubtedly cast a shadow over uh, many uh, trends in the world, including the Middle East. But uh, at the same time, uh, the developments in the MENA region and in Syria in particular <coughs> has their own logic, their own momentum, <coughs> which we should not forget about. <coughs> so today, Today we have two important uh, issues to revisit and to compare notes on. First uh, is our assessment uh, of the modalities of the political settlement in Syria. Do we see any light in the end of the tunnel? Do we see any openings, maybe small incremental openings that might help <coughs> <laughs> the country move uh, to a political dialogue, to an inclusive and fair political transition. And uh, the other uh, important subject that we are going to discuss today is, of course, uh, the state of the humanitarian situation in Syria, whether uh, the situation uh, is deteriorating whether we can uh, argue that uh, it uh, has been more or less stabilized, the impact of uh, international sanctions on Syria, but also the impact uh, of the developments in Ukraine, because of course uh, Syria is also a major consumer of wheat coming from Russia and Ukraine. Syria is likely to be affected uh, by the rise of energy prices, and there are many other implications for Syria, uh, which uh, uh, are caused uh, by the uh, crisis in Europe. Uh, so I don't want to take too much of uh, your time. Let me once again warmly welcome all the Egyptian and Russian experts uh, who found uh, time uh, to join us uh, for this event. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to an inspiring, a candid uh, and uh, hopefully constructive uh, discussion today. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Andre Kortonov. Uh, it is also on behalf of my colleagues, I would like to thank you. And I would like to thank uh, RIAC for this initiative of having uh, a workshop on, on what is uh, happening in Syria in connection with the crisis over uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, we, the whole world, is, is watching that. In fact, uh, let me just uh, uh, remind our uh, audience uh, of the Egyptian uh, position uh, uh, on, on, uh, on Syria. 
as we know uh, um, since its inception uh, uh, the Egyptian position on uh, regarding the Syrian crisis has been based on two parallel pillars. The first uh, is rejecting the fall of the Syrian state at the hands of the forces of extremism and uh, terrorism. Second, supporting the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people for building a better future. Hence, Egypt supports the political settlement of the crisis in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution Number 2254 in a manner that guarantees sparing the lives of the brotherly Syrian people, the preservation of the Syria's unity, sovereignty, and the territorial integrity. Um, <clears throat> halting all forms of foreign intervention in its affairs and the elimination of terrorist organizations on its territories, thus creating a climate conducive for the return of refugees and displaced persons in their homes to their homes in accordance with the uh, determined set by the UNHCR. In its contacts, Egypt affirms the need to spare Syria international competition uh, to, and to distance the Syrian file from other conflicts, thus paving the way for political solution endeavors. Egypt also stresses the necessity of combating all terrorist organizations in Syria classified on the lists of international terrorism with no exceptions or discrimination, tightening the grip on them, drying up their sources of financing, not allowing their members to move from one country to another, and holding the parties sponsoring terrorism accountable, as well as expressing concern regarding the developments in the city of the Al Hasaka in the northeastern of Syria over the past month in terms of the resurgence of the terrorist organization of ISIS or Daesh and the reorganization of its ranks, which requires enhancing efforts to combat terrorism in Syria. Egypt is on equal terms with the various parties to the crisis in Syria, and it has worked and still is to bring the views of the Syrian uh, factions closer to serve the efforts aimed at resolving the crisis. Egypt urges the Syrian government to the necessity of responding to the political settlements efforts under the United Nations auspices and to show flexibility in terms of initiatives for a solution and vis-a-vis -vis moderate opposition groups that believe in serious sovereignty and the territorial integrity and reject the logic of a military solution to the crisis or drawing strength from external parties in order to ease international and regional pressures on Syria, which would lead to its return to its normal position regionally and internationally and allows for the reconstruction of the country. Egypt also supports all sincere efforts that would alleviate the human suffering of the Syrians 
and allow aid to be provided to them, especially with the prolonged crisis and the unprecedented challenges the world has witnessed imposed by other crises such as the corona uh, pandemic. Hence, Egypt is looking forward to the consensus of the member states of the Security Council next July, um, based on a unified version regarding the delivery of humanitarian assistance to Syria in a way that alleviates part of the Syrian people's suffering. Um, today or tomorrow there will be, uh, I think Thursday, there will be a meeting in Paris for the contact group in which uh, Egypt is a member, Egypt, uh, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey, and others. Uh, they are going to meet in Paris to discuss three issues. Uh, uh, first, uh, how to uh, uh, move forward the political process under the auspices of the UN uh, uh, Special Envoy. The second uh, uh, item on the agenda is uh, uh, how to discussing uh, how best to keep the Syrian crisis away from the international competition, in particular what is happening in Ukraine. And the third uh, uh, issue to be discussed in Paris is uh, uh, the uh, coming, the forthcoming donors conference in Brussels that will take place in uh, May 10th, uh, uh, and also how uh, we can uh, uh, urge uh, the those uh, uh, donors who uh, were committed with. Uh, uh, certain uh, uh, amount or uh, certain engagements to help the Syrian uh, people to uh, 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 implement what they were uh, promised uh, for. So these are the three uh, topics uh, the Paris conference will discuss, and uh, in May the 10th, also Egypt will participate in uh, the donors conference in uh, in uh, Brussels. And I will stop here uh, so we can spare time for the uh, uh, our agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Al Said, for sharing with us uh, your vision. Uh, dear colleagues, let me remind you uh, about open format of our meeting. Uh, we plan to post uh, the video at the REAC website. Uh, let's start our first session on the prospects for a political settlement in Syria. And uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, our first speaker, researcher at the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Dr. Matveev. Uh, I, I will try, um, thank you I very will, much, uh, Ivan. Open your presentation, <laughs> just a second. Yes, thank you very much, Ivan, and thank you for REAC and the Egyptian Center for Foreign Affairs for organizing uh, such an event. I would like to say to my uh, to our Egyptian friends, uh, marhaban, sabah uh, al and I would like uh, to start my presentation. Uh, it will be rather brief, around ten minutes. Uh, the name of the presentation will be "Implications of Change in Regional and Global Configuration, Including Conflict in Ukraine on the Conflict Dynamics in Syria." Uh, to start with, I would like to emphasize that I would not, uh, will not touch uh, the, food, the food security of Syria in relations to the Ukrainian crisis, 
since uh, uh, starting from uh, the year 2016, uh, all uh, transfers of uh, grain, uh, food grain, uh, were stopped from Ukraine to Syria, and uh, uh, for mainly political reasons from the Syrian side. So it's uh, the problem of uh, food security is more about Lebanon and not Syria, because Lebanon indeed <coughs> got a huge problem resulting from uh, this situation in Ukraine because of this uh, uh, exports, massive exports of Ukrainian grain to Lebanon, but not to Syria. As um, for my presentation, uh, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, Ivan, can you just uh, give us uh, the next one, the next slide? Yeah, yeah. Can you see it? Yes, I, I cannot see it. Yes, can you do it for me? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I would like just to step to start uh, from uh, USA, Iran, Syria. So we are now looking through global regional dimensions, and uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, uh, USA, Iran, and the Syria. First of all, much here depends on the future, near future. I think of joint comprehensive plan of action, uh, JCPOA. Uh, and you can see on this slide that there are two ways, at least, uh, for this uh, issue. The first one is uh, yes, uh, if uh, the, an agreement uh, to revive uh, work with the uh, joint, comp of comp joint comprehensive plan of action is in place. So uh, a lot of uh, experts, they predict uh, to have more of a run in Syria economically. Yes, there's some sort of <clears throat> uh, problem with the linkage. Okay, uh, so uh, a lot of experts, they predict in this case that there will be more of Iran and Syria economically. So uh, there's some sort of expectations about uh, uh, possible patterns of and lines of competition and cooperation between Russia and Iran and Syria in this respect. But if their answer is no about joint comprehensive plan of action, then there is another option of having more of Iran and Syria territory, uh, mainly in eastern, southern, and western Syria, uh, confronting uh, Israel. So uh, uh, the layout is uh, that more of Iran in the whole of Syria politically is just uh, very questionable. So this is first question. Uh, next slide, please, Ivan. Uh, the second pattern is about USA, Iran, Israel, and Syria. So again, it's uh, uh, much about joint comprehensive plan of action. So if it's a yes, so some uh, limited de-escalation of Iran's anti-Israel activities in Syria uh, could be in place uh, if there is some sort of uh, probably and public agreement between uh, Iran and uh, Biden administration. Uh, concerning giving Iran some uh, economic dividends uh, from uh, Iranian uh, modified behavior in Syria, uh, taking into consideration Israeli concerns. But if the answer is no, if there is no revival of joint comprehensive plan of action, then we would likely to ha have a status quo or even a limited escalation of Iran's anti-Israel activities in Syria, as already mentioned in some geographical areas of Syria. So uh, the layout is that uh, about more dependence of situation in Syria. Um, uh, and uh, uh, here I'd like to say that uh, it's uh, uh, the issue of having more dependence is very important here. More dependence of situation in Syria and Israel on US uh, Iran uh, relations. Ivan, next slide, please. The next slide is about uh, US EU from one side and Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon on the other side. Again, it's much about the uh, future of joint comprehensive plan of action. If it's yes, then we will have witnessed more active bargaining of Iran on various levels uh, about uh, intra Iraqi relations, taking into consideration US concerns and also about the future of Lebanon coming out of uh, by joint efforts of international community 
uh, by donor efforts coming out of this extremely difficult domestic economic situation currently in place in Lebanon and uh, deteriorating uh, crisis in Lebanon, also related to a possible less radical stance of Iran and Syria uh, for economic dividends from the EU and the US. Uh, and uh, if the answer is no, then uh, we will witness less bargaining of Iran on the Iraqi, Syrian, and Lebanese tracks, and at the same time, boosting the so-called the resilience axis, uh, as well as along with the accelerating military confrontation with the Israel. Already, I already spoken about that in the previous slide, but I would like to emphasize uh, the same in this slide as well. So. Uh, the layout is what will be about the so-called Shia Crescent uh, project, which was advocated uh, by Soleimani, General Soleimani, and uh, before, and uh, consisting, encompassing uh, this uh, corridor, land corridor from Iran to Lebanon through Iraq and Syria. Ivan, the next slide, please. Uh, also, I'd like to tell you a few words about Russia, Iran, and Syria. Here, it's uh, more about Russian special military operation in Ukraine. And again, two scenarios, two major options. Escalation, the first one. So it will lead uh, uh, to more sanctions in place against Russia and inevitably to Russia's attempts to for more economic reliance on Iran. And then... In this case, we can have uh, two scenarios, sub-scenarios. So again, there are about the revival of these uh, uh, negotiations, uh, successful negotiations, uh, in case of successful negotiations, about JCPO restarting or not restarting. And the first option uh, could lead to less cooperation with Iran and uh, less coordination in Syria from Iranian side. So the Iranians, they will not be too much interested in cooperation and in coordination with Russia in this case. But if the answer is no, if there is no restart of JCPOA, then it could lead to more cooperation with Iran and more coordination in Syria from both sides, from Russia and Iran. But if there is another option and then by peaceful agreement of the Ukrainian crisis, that could be to less, but again, not zero, definitely not zero sanctions against Russia. So that will, could mean Russia's more economic cooperation, at least intention for more cooperation with Iran. And again, here we can have two options. So GCPO restart and no, no restart. But both options could lead to more cooperation with Iran, but here from Russian side, probably less coordination in Syria. So the layout in this slide is that. We will witness more dependence of Russia on Iran in various cases. Ivan, next slide, please. Uh, another option is Russia, Iran in uh, uh, Russia. Uh, sorry, Russia, Turkey. Uh, there is a mistake in my slide. Russia, Turkey in Syria. So again, it's more about Russian special military operation in Ukraine. Again, two options: escalations. Uh, that will lead to more sanctions already told against Russia. So again, similarly to Iran, Russia's more economic reliance on Turkey. So that could lead to progress in Turkey's, but again, there are two options uh, here. The first one is in case of progress, achieving progress in Turkey's dialogues with the EU and the US. That could mean to less cooperation from Turkish side, less cooperation between Russia and Turkey in Syria, and at the same time, escalation in Idlib and northern Syria, controlled actually by Turkey, from Damascus side, uh, uh, from uh, um, possible activities, military activities from the Syrian Arab army. But if there is no progress in Turkish dialects with the EU and the US, that could lead to more bargaining between Russia and Turkey in Syria, and possibly to the escalation in Idlib and northern Syria. If there is a completely another option, positive scenario, the end of by peaceful agreement of the Ukrainian crisis that again already mentioned uh, could lead to less but not zero sanctions against Russia and Russia's more economic cooperation with Turkey. That could lead again to more bargaining between Russia and Turkey and Syria, even in much broader context in relation to other dossiers and another regional conflicts with the Russia and Turkey involved like Nagorno-Karabakh or Libya, 
whatsoever. So the layout is that the more dependence of Russia on Turkey in terms of uh, peaceful settlements of the Syrian conflict. Ivan, the next slide, please. Russia, Israel, and Syria. So again, it's much about the Russian special military operation in Ukraine. Two general options, escalation and end by peaceful agreement. In terms of uh, the first option, it's uh, Israel grow in case of Israel's growth in growing support of Ukraine. That could lead to Russia's military response to Israeli air attacks on Syria in case of accidental attacks hitting Russian troops or causing some incidents with Russian troops. You know that in history witnessed something like that. And supplies leading to, to Russian supplies to the Syrian Arab army of modern sophisticated air defense weapons. And another option, Israel's limited support of Ukraine on neutrality, it could lead to status quo accuracy and reluctance of Russia's response to Israeli strikes on Syria. On Syria. And there is another general option like an end by a peaceful agreement, again, less but not zero sanctions against Russia, that could be more Russia's uh, political military coordination and economic cooperation with Israel, uh, preserving status quo in Syria. So the layout is more dependence of Russia in, uh, is on Israel in terms of Ukraine and vice versa, Israel's more dependence on Russia in Syria and with possible scenario of escalation of situation military in Syria under a negative scenario. The next slide, the final slide, please. Yes, so Russian, again, Russia, Arab Gulf states in Syria pattern. So that's again, much about Russian special military operation in Ukraine in case of escalation against, in, in case of two sub scenarios like JCPO's restart or no restart that could lead to a status quo, preserving status quo and serious post-conflict reconstruction with the very limited Arab Gulf's in Fitah, so the openness policy, with no reliance of Arab Gulf states on so-called the Syrian security, security matrix in Syria. But just a few words about the security matrix. So it's some sort of uh, a situation created by previous positive Russian experiences in building local ceasefire regimes uh, mediation of Russia's successful mediation in different regions of Syria, so-called Musalahat, so and uh, leading to creating favorable conditions for a start of economic activities and building local national dialects with the ethnical and confessional minorities. So, if there is another scenario like a peaceful and of the Ukrainian crisis with a peaceful agreement that could again, as already told you, with other scenarios, it could lead with less but not zero sanctions against Russia. So it will lead in turn to a broader Arab Gulf in Fitah and Syria with the reliance, with possible reliance on the Russian security matrix, with possible inclusion to this process of Egypt and Maghreb Arab, Arab states. And the layout is that more dependence of economic situation in Syria on dynamics of Russia's special operation in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention. We still have uh, like eight uh, minutes, uh, well, uh, for, uh, if you wish, i just kindly ask Ivan <laughs> if somebody has some questions about my presentation, because unfortunately, then I need to leave you. Uh, yes, please. Um, are there any questions to Dr. Matveev? If uh, no, thank you, uh, Igor Alexandrovich, for your informative presentation. Uh, let me give the floor to Ambassador Mohammed Badr Al Din uh, Said, uh, ECFA expert. The floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Ivan, we will just uh, 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 change uh, the one who will speak first is uh, uh, Dr. Ala Al Hadidi uh, okay. and uh, Ambassador uh, Zaid will speak in the second uh, session. Okay, no problem. Mind. So, let's go ahead. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Ala Al Hadidi will, will uh, begin. Uh, good yes, morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure always to uh, interact with uh, uh, my colleagues and friends from uh, Russia. Uh, Actually, 
I would like to uh, speak about the international situation uh, from the perspective here in Cairo. Uh, and I will leave the implications on Syria to uh, my colleague, uh, Ambassador Mohammed Badreddin Zaid. Uh, I will confine myself to uh, the, the conflict in Ukraine and uh, the various uh, scenarios uh, to uh, complement what was being said by uh, the previous uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to say that uh, <clears throat> there are uh, four possible scenarios uh, which we must uh, take into consideration uh, three of them, or two of them, is uh, time scenarios. One, is, the other is uh, geographical, and the fourth is political. Uh, let me let me be more concise. Uh, the first scenario is that uh, the conflict in Ukraine will end uh, in a short time. Uh, some analysis has been speaking that. Uh, by the 9th of uh, May, uh, the, the conflict will uh, come to an end. Uh, this is a perception uh, among several uh, people, uh, observers. And uh, of course, if we are speaking about the short term implication, uh, then we have several scenarios coming out of it. Uh, if the conflict uh, really ends on the 9th of May or before that or after that, was a, I mean, a short uh, span of time, uh, then we have uh, uh, an international situation which uh, is uh, almost defined now that uh, regardless of the outcome in Ukraine, we have a division uh, and we have a new Cold War. Uh, we have uh, two main competing uh, camps, the Western camp, uh, United States, uh, the EU, and then we have uh, the other side, Russia and its allies. So uh, the, the, the military conflict here in uh, Ukraine is not the main factor in the implication of on the situation in Syria, it is the kind of international order which will uh, emerge if it has not already emerged uh, in the next uh, few uh, weeks. And thus, the, 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 the main uh, uh, interactions or the main uh, interlocutors will be political, and we will enter into a a new phase in international relations with all its implications on uh, whether we're speaking about uh, the United Nations system, we're speaking about various other organiza regional organizations, and uh, I leave that to my colleagues, as has been mentioned uh, before, uh, to speak about the specific application on uh, Syria. Uh, the other scenario, the second scenario, is uh, if we are for what's called the long haul. Uh, we are for an, uh, a, a very long period of uh, hostilities occurring in Ukraine. Uh, some analysis believe that it's the intention of the United States, of NATO, to prolong the conflict in Ukraine as long as possible. Uh, now we are not speaking about weeks, we are speaking about months. Uh, it could be a month, it could be one year, it could be even more, it could drag on. Uh, naturally, in, in that kind of scenario, in that kind of uh, situation, in that kind of time frame, we are speaking about a different dynamic uh, than uh, if we had uh, an early end of the conflict. Uh, if that scenario uh, prevails, then we are in a state of uh, tension, 
uh, exacerbated by the, the, the conflict in Ukraine and all the implications uh, we'll see in the uh, military side what's going to happen. Uh, uh, and we uh, can anticipate that it will have a different uh, dynamic on Syria uh, since the focus and the main concern of uh, the belligerent parties is going to be military. Uh, no talk of political settlement, no talk of whether in Ukraine or in uh, Syria, uh, no talk of, uh, of any kind of political uh, dialogue uh, internationally. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a mindset which is completely different and uh, I don't think we have witnessed something like that uh, in, in the past 40-50 years. We are not speaking about a Cold War, we are speaking about a, a protracted uh, conflict with all its implications. Uh, the other uh, scenario, the third scenario, of course, is a much more scary scenario, which is uh, the spillover uh, militarily and the expansion of the conflict in uh, Ukraine, what we are saying, in which it's no longer uh, just uh, two adversaries, uh, but we will have uh, other countries getting involved militarily. Uh, maybe it will develop into a kind of uh, an international uh, conflict, uh, military, international military conflict. It's no longer going to be confined to uh, the land uh, of or the uh, territory of Ukraine, it could expand to other countries. And whether this is done uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, history teaches us that uh, a lot of things can happen by uh, unintentionally, by mistakes. Uh, and we can find ourselves in a situation in which we have a shooting war, uh, not, uh, not, not confined to uh, Ukraine. And of course, uh, in that case, then it, it links with the second scenario, which is going to be a very long uh, war. And uh, it's not going to stop uh, in a particular geographical area. It could expand to other geographical areas, uh, including, of course, uh, Syria. Uh, the fourth uh, scenario is reaching a political settlement. And uh, Reaching a political settlement could also uh, happen after one of the uh, three previous scenarios. Uh, if we have uh, a, an end to the conflict in, in a couple of weeks, as uh, we all hope, uh, then maybe a political settlement uh, is, will follow. Uh, whatever uh, the situation is going to be, uh, definitely, there is going to be a political settlement. Uh, not definitely, but I mean, hopefully, it will be a, a there will be a political settlement uh, uh, someplace along the road, and hopefully, the sooner uh, the better for everybody, with its implications. Uh, speaking about the political settlement, uh, and speak about the previous three scenarios. Uh, this is on one level. On another level, as my previous uh, uh, Russian colleague uh, explained uh, and expanded. Uh, there is also, uh, I would like to re, re point about uh, five actors who will be involved uh, in uh, Syria, one way or the other. Uh, some of them have been mentioned before, but uh, let me just highlight some of, uh, some of the things. Uh, China. Uh, despite the fact that China is not a visible actor in the Middle East, but definitely its role on the international scene, definitely its special relationship with uh, Russia, definitely the kind of behavior China will conduct itself in the current conflict in uh, Ukraine will determine to a large extent, the behavior of the other actors uh, in the region and uh, internationally. Uh, 
And uh, China may not be visible, but uh, I believe that uh, uh, China growing interest in the Middle East, growing need for uh, Middle East uh, energy, whether you speak about uh, oil or uh, natural gas, uh, gradually, it will be playing uh, a role, and uh, definitely, uh, it will be, I think, uh, welcomed by uh, many uh, parties in the uh, region and internationally. Uh, the other uh, actor, uh, which was touched on by the previous speaker, is, of course, the Gulf countries and their current uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the situation in uh, Ukraine and to what extent the Gulf countries will be willing to uh, contribute one way or the other uh, to end uh, this, the current uh, situation. Uh, we are all witnessing the dynamics which are happening to the American Gulf uh, relationship we are witnessing some strategic changes in the Gulf, in the orientation of the Gulf uh, countries. And uh, in my humble opinion, we are still in a transitional period concerning uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, definitely there is rethinking of the international situation, especially after the American withdrawal from Afghanistan the American position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, uh, and a host of other issues. So the Gulf countries, I think, will also be a determining factor uh, in the situation in uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, it's still in the making. It's not yet final, but uh, it's worth uh, noting. The third actor, which uh, 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 my Russian colleague uh, expanded on very, very uh, forcefully uh, is, of course, Iran and uh, and what will happen to uh, the nuclear deal. I was never able to to memorize the whole uh, title of the of the deal, the comprehensive whatever act it is. But anyway. And one of the things which is very interesting for me as uh, an Egyptian observer is how eager are uh, the Americans to, uh, to finalize a deal with uh, Iran. Uh, we all know why, uh, why they, are, they want to do that. We all understand the, uh, the economic, implement, uh, economic implications of uh, reaching the deal, the role Iran can play uh, in uh, providing uh, the international market <clears throat> oil, especially with the reluctance of the Gulf countries to, uh, uh, increase, uh, to yeah. increase the amount of oil uh, as the Americans uh, want. So uh, one can say that there is here a kind of a dynamic between the position of the Gulf countries and the uh, when it comes to the oil market and the, the position of the Americans vis-a-vis -vis Iran. The, 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 the less America, the less the Gulf countries are, are interested or inclined to help the Americans, the more the Americans will be uh, wishing or, or hopeful that they will reach an agreement with uh, Iran. Uh, if the Gulf countries uh, change their mind and become responsive to the American demands, I think then the American uh, need for a deal with Iran will uh, decrease. Uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth actor, of course, is uh, Turkey. And uh, here, Turkey, uh, from my experience as an ex-ambassador uh, in Ankara, is that you can never know what the next move of Erdogan is going to be. Uh, whatever assumptions is based on uh, Turkey today, it can easily change tomorrow, either because of domestic considerations. And remember that uh, Turkey uh, is going to witness uh, presidential elections uh, next year. So the internal factor is going to be playing a major role in shaping the Turkish position uh, 
vis-a-vis uh, what's happening in Ukraine, vis-a-vis the relationship with the Americans, vis-a-vis the NATO, Syria. and vis-a-vis, of course, uh, Syria. So a lot will depend on the developments on the internal uh, front in uh, Turkey and whether the opposition uh, is going to be able to represent a real threat to uh, Erdogan. And it's not just the economic situation inside uh, Turkey. It is uh, much more complicated than that. And uh, the calculations of Erdogan are primarily domestic more than uh, foreign. I'm not saying that it's purely domestic. I'm not saying that he doesn't have his own uh, uh, international calculations, but I'm saying that uh, the role domestic uh, politics play in shaping uh, Turkish foreign policy is much larger than uh, we think. Finally, of course, is Israel. Uh, it was beautifully said by the previous speaker about Israel and describing the relationship and its position. Uh, I would add that one of the things which everybody is uh, following here uh, in, the, in, in, in the Middle East, in, in Egypt, is interest, is the relationship, the growing relationship between Israel and the Gulf countries. Uh, the GCC countries, the Arab uh, Gulf countries. And of course, everybody knows the position of Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran and reaching deal, but also it's very interesting to see how the play between, how the, the interaction between Israel and the Gulf countries is going to impact uh, the situation in uh, Syria, uh, how the the, 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 sh the shifting paradigms of uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. I'm is sorry, uh, let me remind you about uh, time limitation. Yeah, that was my final point. Okay. Uh, and uh, just one final sentence is that all of these uh, actors, what's happening between them, regardless of, uh, of the situation in uh, either Ukraine or uh, Syria is going to be uh, very uh, noticeable in the next few uh, weeks, months, whatever, and we'll see the implications. Thank you, and sorry for being so long. Uh, thank you very much for your report for constructing scenarios uh, of uh, the future of um, how uh, the situation uh, in uh, Syria will develop. Uh, let me, uh, I think we have a little time for discussion. I think uh, we can give the floor to somebody from the React site for a very, very short uh, remark and uh, somebody from uh, ECFA uh, site. Uh, who'd like to say something, please write your, uh, raise your hand. Uh, Boris Vasilich, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Boris Dolgov, uh, Doctor of History. Uh, the first of all, uh, uh, I would like to uh, speak a few about uh, the uh, starting and, uh, of the uh, causes of uh, Syrian crisis. Uh, of course, uh, it was uh, the internal problems, some internal problems in Syria, and uh, of course, the main uh, causes of the crisis in Syria, uh, by my opinion, uh, it, uh, it was external, external uh, causes. So the support of uh, Western countries and some uh, regional uh, countries to uh, radical groups, uh, Islamist radical groups in Syria. And then uh, it was uh, this uh, crisis uh, uh, for many years. Uh, but uh, uh, mm, uh, why uh, Western countries uh, supported uh, the, exter uh, the uh, extremist uh, uh, radical Islamist groups in Syria? Because it was the uh, politics of uh, Western countries against Russia, because uh, they uh, wanted uh, uh, to bring uh, in Damascus uh, as a 
uh, so as a government uh, in Damascus, uh, radical Islamist groups, and then uh, so change the region in Damascus, and then uh, direct uh, expansion expansion of uh, uh, this uh, radical Islamist groups, uh, radical Islamism uh, to uh, uh, Republic of uh, uh, Russia, uh, former republics of Soviet Union, uh, as Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan, etc., and uh, also direct uh, radical Islamism to Iran and to Russia. It was, uh, uh, unfortunately, the politics of uh, Western countries uh, at that uh, period. And the same politics uh, we saw now in the Ukrainian crisis. So the same politics. Uh, so uh, Western countries used the Ukraine as a weapon against Russia. And now uh, we, we saw uh, some um, elements of radical Islamists from Syria uh, who, uh, who is coming uh, to Ukraine to, to fight uh, against uh, Russia and against the, the two republics of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. It's the same politics, unfortunately, uh, of uh, Western countries. And uh, about uh, the uh, situation now in Syria. I think uh, that uh, the uh, mm, biggest problem in Syria now, of course, it is uh, economical problem, uh, of course, and also uh, the uh, problem, uh, which is a uh, big, big problem, uh, occupation of uh, uh, external uh, actors, uh, uh, some Syrian uh, territory. So we know that it was um, Turkish um, um, uh, uh, Turkish uh, military uh, forces in region of Idlib in Syria, and also Turkish uh, military forces in the border of border Syrian Turkish, and uh, also and and uh, at uh, this. Uh, region, uh, the Turkey um, set uh, regional uh, authorities, uh, local authorities, uh, also uh, against uh, Damascus. And uh, then we saw uh, the occupation by um, American military forces, uh, some uh, regions of the territory uh, of Syria, uh, at Tanfa, it is a region uh, where um, it, uh, it was a military uh, base of USA. Uh, also, it was uh, it is uh, the danger uh, for um, to resort uh, to uh, to do uh, the uh, so uh, peace settlements and uh, political settlements, political decision. Uh, of a Syrian crisis. Uh, and also, uh, we saw, mm, I repeat, the uh, same politics of Western countries, unfortunately, the same uh, politics of Western countries uh, in Syrian crisis and in Ukrainian crisis against Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boris Vasilyevich, for your comment. Uh, I will just add that I only read about Syrians who were sent to Ukraine uh, to fight uh, for Russia against uh, Ukraine. Uh, dear colleagues from the ECFA site, uh, maybe somebody wants to uh, add something, or can we start our next session? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> if you don't mind, Mr. Ivan, uh, uh, from our part, uh, Ambassador. Uh, uh, Mohammed Badruddin Zaid will speak, but before uh, touching upon the humanitarian situation, he would like to say a few words uh, related to the first session, that is uh, the prospects of political settlement in Syria, if you don't mind. <coughs> 
good morning. It's my pleasure to, to participate with you and, and this fruitful. <clears throat> uh, I think it's very important to uh, maybe a little bit oversimplify what is going on in Syria before we understand what the, could be the impact of the Ukraine uh, issue or crisis on the Syrian uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, and how far we are from any city. Uh, we have to uh, to define two sets of or two elements of improvement and deterioration deterioration in the uh, Syrian crisis. The first set, which we can call it the improvement in the uh, in the situation and the, uh, bring us close to a political settlement, uh, is the more opening we saw during the last two years between uh, uh, between some Arab countries the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia a little bit, uh, Egypt, Jordan, uh, with the uh, Syrian government. Uh, the second uh, improvement is the gradual ret return of uh, Syria in the regional economic uh, project. In particular, the Egyptian gas uh, issue to uh, Lebanon through Syria, which is also a very important uh, Step. Uh, the third uh, improvement is the status quo. That's the, the government in Damascus is in control and uh, is starting to uh, to work or to behave more normally in the international scene. But we have uh, some element of deterioration which will take us more to what is the, uh, the challenge that you are facing. <clears throat> Uh, the previous speakers uh, talk about the occupation on the Turkish border or the northern border. We are seeing now, during the last two, three years, a kind of status quo of uh, occupation, Turkish occupation, plus uh, we are uh, dealing with a Nusra government in the Idlib side and in the northeast side of the, uh, or we can say a kind of authority and the international organization are dealing with this authority, which is, it is definitely a catastrophic situation. And we are see, seeing also the Kurdish uh, troops are controlling the uh, northwest side. Uh, the second element of deterioration is the uh, chronic econom economic uh, difficulties which uh, face uh, the uh, the government of Syria and the Syrian uh, people. Of course, uh, uh, that we are far away from any serious talk about reconstruction. The third element, even before the crisis in Ukraine, the return of ISIS and uh, Nostra uh, and the, their control in, in some part of this Syrian desert. Uh, and if I, uh, if I am I'm trying to, uh, Ambassador, my colleague Ambassador Hadidi, talk about the four scenarios, I think when it comes to Syria, we have to, to focus on, on two, on, on another perspective. Actually, we are dealing with two scenarios only, either Russian success or Western success. And this will have huge impact, and I, I think this could take, I don't want to take more time because you we will have another session, but uh, uh, we are two. We have two routes actually. If the West succeed in uh, in this in the Ukraine crisis, this will have great impact on the Syrian issue. It will get more complicated, and we might start from the beginning there again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, that uh, um, Dr. Zaid can uh, moderate our next session on humanitarian issues. Yes, uh, uh, now we will uh, deal with uh, the humanitarian situation, I guess. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ambassador Zaid, can you 
say a few words on that, and then <clears throat> we will listen to uh, Mr. Uh, Vasily uh, Kuznetsov. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I actually, uh, when we talk about humanitarian, we have uh, different files that we, uh, we need to talk about. The first, of course, is, of course not, the humanitarian is a broad uh, issue, it include the first of all, the refugee issue. What we are seeing now in the either in the Jordanian or the uh, Lebanese, the Turkish uh, uh, territories, that the refugee issue is getting more and more uh, difficult, getting more and more complicated. And the, in, in Jordan, for example, they talk now about uh, the urgent need to deal with this issue. It's, it's, we are dealing now with more than 10 years of the refugee issue. When the refugee issue uh, continued like this for many years, and, uh, and they discovered there is no hope in the end of the tunnel after the, the, the civil control of the Syrian government of most of, or at least 60% or 70% of the Syrian territories, now the people are still, uh, are getting uh, the feeling that what, what is the next step for us, especially in Jordan, and with the fact that most of those refugees are actually staying on the rural area in Jordan, where the poverty line is very high, uh, and they, uh, when we go to the Lebanon now with the economic crisis there, they had some hope that the end of the crisis, that the, the, the Syrians are going to return. This didn't happen. So with this situation, we have to expect more difficulties on the, in the Lebanon uh, uh, dilemma itself. Uh, and now in Turkey, they talk about the return of the, the Syrian refugee after they use it for a tool for many years to get uh, assistance and the black mail, the Western countries, they are talk, take, talking now in, in the, before the election in Turkey that the, those refugees should uh, go back to Syria now. Where they will go, this is a, a very important issue. If they are going to Idlib, then we are increasing the, uh, the, the community for more uh, ISIS and Nostra groups. Because when you have a, a poverty line like this, this could be a, a very uh, critical issue, and it could endanger us to, the, to see more, more actually of the uh, ISIS return to Syria. Uh, the second issue is the issue of, uh, of reconstruction. Of course, now I don't think there will be any talk now uh, regarding reconstruction. What is the situation in uh, in Ukraine now? And the West uh, didn't help in the previous years to, to improve this, the discussion about reconstruction. And the Chinese didn't do anything in particular. I think it's, we have to, uh, to connect all the, the, the players together now. Where's the political issue? If there will be any kind of solution or settlement, then we will talk about reconstruction. But right now, I think the first impact of the Ukraine crisis that we shouldn't expect any serious talk in the coming meetings in Paris or elsewhere about reconstruction. And of course, again, we'll go back to the two scenarios that I was talking about, Russian success or Western success, because the sanctions will depend more sanctions if the Russians succeed uh, to end the crisis in Ukraine, then we should expect that uh, uh, maybe we will talk about more Arab opening to, with the Syrian regime. But if the opposite happened, then we, could, we can expect more pressure on Arab countries not to open with Syrian regime. That's me, and it could mean also more sanctions on the uh, Russian government. Uh, last week, they were talking about, again, uh, some uh, new sanctions on the Western media uh, towards the Syrian government. 
And this is, could be a beginning of a new movement or a new wave of sanctions again. Uh, and this wave will be an opposite to the openings that we saw in the last two or three years. So, uh, the, in general, the humanitarian uh, situation is going to deteriorate more if the crisis in Ukraine continued for many months to come or many weeks, or if the, the, uh, the result of the crisis will be a kind of uh, re-establishing the Western uh, control of the international system. I think this, uh, I, I tried to be very brief uh, due to the short time and to give some uh, time for more discussion at that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, there are many details, uh, Mr. Ivan, on uh, Egypt's uh, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian refugees. As you know, we have... Uh, uh, almost uh, 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 more than 150,000 uh, Syrians are living among us. Uh, but uh, uh, just because of the time, I would rather uh, give the floor to Mr. Vasily Kuznetsov, and if we have time after that, we might uh, return back to this point. The floor is uh, yours, uh, Mr. Kuznetsov. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I will try to, uh, to say uh, just a few words because I think that uh, we uh, it will be better if we have time for discussion. But uh, the main points, uh, the, uh, Professor Kurtanov started to, to, uh, our today's meeting the question is the situation in uh, is the humanitarian situation in Syria is deteriorating or not, and what is the impact of the situation in Ukraine? I think that uh, of course I'm absolutely agree with uh, my uh, our Egyptian uh, friends and colleagues that uh, the, the situation is deteriorating, uh, and uh, it will be deteriorated, and uh, and it will deteriorate, and. Uh, uh, but uh, last uh, years and last months, uh, we have seen uh, this deterioration because of four factors, I think. Uh, first, of course, it is a Caesar law and, uh, and in general, the sanctions regime, uh, the Western sanctions uh, are, play a really very negative role on, uh, in the Syrian situation. The second is the situation in Lebanon. And uh, it is a uh, very important, uh, not uh, at the same time methodological and uh, practical question. If we should think about the humanitarian situation in Syria uh, separately from the uh, situation in Lebanon, uh, because the, the humanitarian situation uh, in two countries are very related. Uh, the third moment, of course, it is a COVID pandemic. And the fourth is the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, the winter, uh, this winter was uh, very difficult in Syria. And uh, now uh, the situation may be not, is not worse, but uh, it is not better. Of course, uh, it is not worse because, uh, because of the weather. And uh, so they, they don't need uh, so much, uh, gas and oil, but uh, there, no, there is no gas, no oil, uh, we have a huge uh, food problems, uh, even in Damascus. Uh, there is no sugar, no cereals in the, in the, uh, the market and so on. Uh, and uh, the question, and of course, uh, in uh, this situation, I agree that uh, uh, with the uh, Ukrainian crisis, uh, the, situ the, the situation uh, may become worse. Uh, I think that we have three main factors which will uh, which will uh, leverage uh, the situation. 
the first, uh, it is uh, GCPOA, of course. The second, it is a Saudi-Iranian relations, and I mean, uh, firstly, Baghdad process. And the third is the Ukrainian situation. Generally, we can say that uh, if we have uh, negative scenarios in uh, this, on these three uh, tracks, we'll have a, a catastrophic scenario in uh, Syria. And if we, if we have uh, uh, positive scenarios in these uh, three tracks, we can have uh, not uh, catastrophic, but uh, just a not very good scenario in Syria. Uh, what options do we have today to improve for somehow the situation, the humanitarian situation? First is, it is, I think, of course, the involvement of uh, involvement of uh, Gulf states in uh, to resolve the humanitarian uh, problems, and we have we have this uh, between uh, Cairo and Abu Dhabi now. I think that Abu Dhabi can be interested in uh, uh, in participation uh, in improving the situation, the humanitarian and economical situation in Syria. Uh, primarily in the context of their competition with uh, rivalry with uh, Iran. Uh, and uh, in this context, the question of reintegrating Syria to the Arab League become uh, more important than it was. Uh, the, another option is uh, the involvement of uh, Asian uh great powers uh i think mostly not about china but more about india uh because uh, i think that india will uh, uh indian role will uh, will become uh, much bigger uh, in the middle east uh, next months and next years uh, firstly because of the food situation uh, and the uh, Indian role on the food market. And uh, in this context and in the context of the competition with China, it can be more interested in uh, participation in Syrian affairs. Uh, the other point, uh, I just a short remark, uh, is uh, uh, about refugees. Uh, I am uh, absolutely agree with my colleagues that uh, the, ref the situation with the refugee crisis is over, but uh, I think that uh, in Turkey, the situation is changing to, uh, uh, to better, it's become better, uh, becoming better because, uh, of course, the uh, refugees, uh, three and a half million refugees played uh, in general, negative role in uh, for uh, Turkish economy, uh, but now uh, with the change in situation because of Ukraine, and with uh, and uh, the situation in Turkish economy become better, and it will become better, and uh, Erdogan uh, become much more popular than uh, he was, uh, I don't know, three months ago. So I think that maybe for the moment, uh, they don't have so big pressure on them uh, on the refugee issue, and uh, they won't insist on uh, return refugees in, on the Syrian territory. Uh, I will stop here, so we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Professor Vasili, wasn't it so? And I think, uh, um, unless uh, 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 one, someone from both parties will uh, raise a question or something, uh, uh, we can uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Kortonov to. Uh, uh, say a few words, a closing remarks, because we are almost 11.20. What do you think, Mr. Ivan? 
let me propose to give uh, the floor to Alexey Klebnikov for a short remark, and then um, I think we can uh, okay, say some post remarks. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, dear colleagues, for your um, input into this um, discussion. I want to share a couple of thoughts on the humanitarian situation, uh, in particular, uh, with regard to the cross-border mechanism of uh, delivering UN aid to Syria uh, from Turkey uh, via Babel Hawa. With the Ukrainian crisis, um, humanitarian situation actually in both countries started to look quite similar in terms of the provision of the aid. Uh, as in Syria, so as in the Ukraine. Um, the cross-line aid deliveries are quite problematic and they remain quite problematic. Uh, and uh, in Syria, cross-border um, aid delivery still exists, but it's due to uh, another vote uh, in June, July this year. While in Ukraine, the humanitarian situation in the eastern uh, part of the country remains also quite uh, demanding, and there are a lot of um, needs there, and uh, there is no cross-border activities uh, whatsoever by the United Nations or ICRC or any other humanitarian uh, organizations, while needs there are present, while cross line activities are also absent because of uh, neither side can give security guarantees for any humanitarian convoy to um, to enter uh, those areas. The, almost the same situation we see we witness in Syria, where cross-line uh, convoys. So it's almost a year since the uh, United Nations Resolution 2585 has been adopted. We've just witnessed three humanitarian convoys cross-line, which uh, were delivered aid from government controlled areas to northeast, uh, northwest Syria to Idlib. And here is the interesting interconnection comes to, uh, at least to my mind, that um, that might be a very beneficial and um, a move uh, which can benefit uh, all uh, parties, all sides. So uh, it seems that uh, while the time for the another vote for Syria cross-border uh, mechanism resolution will come, uh, Russia might see it very useful to, uh, to condition prolongation of this resolution, uh, demanding cross-border aid deliveries to east of Ukraine from the Russian territories. And in that case, uh, I mean, both sides win, uh, the population in needs uh, will uh, start receiving aid uh, in, in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, in uh, republics of Donetsk and Lugansk. And uh, people in need in uh, Idlib, which is about 3.5 million also will get uh, access to, uh, or will, will continue to receive uh, humanitarian um, aid. So this interesting small comment and remark about this uh, similarity of Ukrainian crisis and uh, Syrian crisis in terms of humanitarian access and uh, specifically on the cross-border um, mechanism of aid delivery. Thank you. Well, I think uh, that uh, we can uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Kortunov, if you uh, uh, don't mind, to uh, close our meeting. Uh, thank you, Ivan. That was a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking conversation. I cannot consider myself to be a great expert on Syria, so I am probably not in a position to summarize uh, the deliberations that we have so far. But uh, let me just say <clears throat> a couple of words uh, on a uh, broader issue. It was mentioned here that uh, a lot uh, in the future developments in Syria and arguably in the MENA region at large uh, will depend uh, on the outcome of the conflict uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and essentially the question is, uh, who is going to have the upper hand? Uh, is it going to be Russia? Is it going to be the West? I would like to offer you a slightly different uh, framework 
which uh, I consider to be uh, important and potentially productive when we analyze developments, not just in Europe, but also uh, in the MENA region, the developments which might affect the future of Syria. I think that uh, the world is uh, at a crossroads once again, and there are not two, but uh, rather three plausible scenarios in which the international system might evolve in years to come. Uh, the first scenario I would uh, label as uh, 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 more or less uh, uh, return to the past, restoration of the old order. And that implies uh, a new unity of the West. It implies that Russia remains isolated. It implies that uh, the West will be able to impose its will on the rest, at least for some time. And that would definitely color the developments in the region. It would make the Western positions in Syria much stronger tomorrow than they are today. Uh, the second option I would call restoration and uh, uh, reformation, sorry, Reformation, that implies that uh, as a result of the crisis, uh, and not just this crisis, but developments of last couple of years, we'll see uh, a more reformed international system, which uh, would uh, imply changes in how international organizations uh, perform uh, a new role for China, but not only China. You know, here we heard uh, uh, statements about India and some other. Uh, major states which are likely to play a more active role in the international system. And that would definitely affect uh, Middle East and Syria. We will see new players entering the uh, game. Uh, we will see new coalitions. Some of them will be situational. Some of them might be strategic, but uh, definitely that will become uh, less Western uh, and uh, uh, more uh, universal engagement. And finally, I think that we can see a revolution. We can see uh, a collapse of the existing institutions, uh, procedures, rules, and norms of international law. <coughs> and in this case, of course, uh, Syria will be one of the um, theaters of um, uh, multilateral, not uh, cooperation, but multilateral competition and confrontation which will not be limited to state actors only, but would, would also include uh, non-state actors becoming more active <laughs> in pursuing their goals and uh, fighting for their causes. I think that the jury is still in session. We really don't know the answers. Hopefully within the next couple of months, when the dust is <clears throat> down, we will have more clarity on the situation. But uh, I'm sure that Syria will remain in the focus of international attention and uh, it will continue to be one of the hotspots hot of uh, uh, conflicts uh, with a very significant impact, not only on regional countries, but also on countries far away uh, from uh, Syria. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your conclusions. Uh, let me give the floor to Dr. Said uh, for delivering closing remarks. Thank you very much. I think uh, I wouldn't differ from uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Cortolo said. Uh, just to add that uh, all scenarios. Uh, are are open. I mean, it's very difficult to uh, uh, prefer or uh, to uh, to put these scenarios in a certain order. Uh, Besides what is happening in Ukraine or the possible outcome, uh, I think uh, we agreed also uh, during our discussion. Uh, on the fact that uh, the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, whether it will be concluded or not, uh, is also a factor uh, on uh, the prospect of uh, political solution in Syria or the situation as a whole in Syria, Lebanon, and also in Israel. Uh, 
Uh, the second point I would like to make uh, is about is about the policy of the Gulf, the Arab Gulf countries. Uh, it was mentioned by uh, Ambassador uh, Ala as uh, I mean those countries as uh, main player, and we cannot deny. Uh, uh, the transformation of the situation of those countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Turkey, the United States, uh, Iran. Uh, but uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, the position of the United Arab Emirates maybe is more uh, clear than the others. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, President Bashar al-Assad visiting uh, Emirates and also the foreign minister of uh, UAE and, and so on. But uh, in my opinion, we should not uh, pay or attach a great importance on the situation of the Gulf countries when it comes to Syria in particular. Uh, uh, we should not forget the fact that uh, those countries were the ones that uh, uh, helped the, uh, the terrorist Islamic organizations in Syria earlier in 2011. And uh, as what uh, our colleague Boris uh, Dolgov mentioned, uh, on the other hand, uh, the Gulf countries uh, are moving in that file with the hope that President Bashar al-Assad will, you know, uh, do something about the influence of Iran inside Syria. And this is also something I doubt very much. I don't think uh, President Bashar al-Assad will be able to do so. Uh, beside, we didn't uh, receive any signs from him uh, that he is able really to do that. But once again, uh, let us hope that uh, the coming uh, donor conference in Brussels uh, at least will do uh, something about easing the humanitarian suffering of the Syrian people. And uh, we are, will be very happy to continue our uh, exchange with REAC in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very informative uh, discussion, very informative meeting. Have a good day. Masalama. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. 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 Shukran.